Joseph Jaffe is not famous. I'm kind of famous. I'm Jerry Springer. And Jaffe is no host. He'd be lucky to be in my audience, let alone on my show. Well, maybe he's crazy enough to be on my show. I take that back. And that's not a good thing. A spring in your step. There is a twinkle in your eye. I, 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 can, I can throw a rhyme down for you real quick. Yes, they call me Thrill. They say that I'm the man. You disagree. How could you? Let me make you understand. Should we bring her on the show? Can anybody find me? And there she is. Press as some bread. Put right it from the oven. When you feel rejected, you get some like a loving. She looks wonderful. Mom looks amazing. Somebody too. Okay, more bugger off now. I've got to show it to you. No. Like that? Joseph Jaffe, ladies and gentlemen. You just made the new intro of the show. <laughs> Tom Peters is co-author of In Search of Excellence. The book often tagged as the best business book ever. I think I tagged it. Uh, 20 books <laughs> and 40 years later, Tom is still at the forefront of the management guru industry. He single-handedly invented. His newest book with co-author Nancy Green is Tom Peters' Compact Guide to Excellence. And it is published by Dear Press Publishing, which also published my fifth book, Built to Suck. And this was published in November of 2022. Tom's tireless focus is on putting people first and developing leaders who stay in intimate touch with the frontliners who do the real work. And even in that, you sense certain words that are different to anyone else, maybe in the industry or even the world when we think about this idea of people and the word intimate. In November 2017, Tom received the Thinkers 50 Lifetime Achievement Award. And I can tell you uh, that constantly for the last 10 years, I've been voted number 51 on Thinkers Top 50 Award. <laughs> and he's laughing in the background. Let's bring him on. Tom, welcome back to the show. Well, I could announce my retirement, and that would bring you up by one on the list. I, we, I, have, I have a feeling I'd still be 51, um, <laughs> but there's nothing I can do about it. It, it, it is what it is. Um, welcome back to the show where we decidedly have less uh, technical difficulties. I remember all too well what we fought through, as it were, in the past. I, I've been to therapy, and uh, so, and that and medication is helping. I, you know, when I had the opportunity to sit down with the Tom Peters, and uh, you know, I, I guess I learned a lot from that experience, which is, which I suppose leaders can learn too, which is, uh, which is, you have to be kind to other people, but that begins by being kind to yourself, giving yourself grace, uh, and and recognizing that life is not perfect. And it's kind of how we deal with these problems and challenges that really uh, gears us up for moving forward. At least that's what I tell myself. Sounds good. I do. I do want to clarify one one thing. Uh, I know that people say I invented the management guru industry. That may or may not be true, but the damned term management guru came from the year-end issue of The Economist. I didn't do it in any way, shape, or form. And I guess I should love them for that. But the real reality is I'll never forgive them. I do not like the word guru. Well, listen, we, we operate in a, in a world of innovation, digital, social, mobile, uh, Web3, where uh, we've invented words like ninja and... <laughs> And all these ridiculous words to describe the self-proclaimed and self-professed uh, thought leader. You are uh, a leader of thought and a thought leader, and uh, and and I have a book to prove it. <laughs> so I have to tell you that this book. Um, first of all, this uh, you know I'm going to try not to get emotional, uh, only because 
they tell me I have a heart of stone and I'm not able to get emotional. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but this inscription that says, I mean, okay, it's addressed to Seth Godin, but that doesn't matter. I've scratched it off. And it says, Joseph Jaffe book, uh, is it 20 or 70? Should we go with 20 or 70? 20 or 70. Oh, book number. Yeah. This, well, this is definitely book number 20. Yeah, book number 20. I was going to give you 70. Book 20, My Lost, uh, Lost, and an effort to boil down 43 years of work. Um, this is something that I will uh, cherish. It's, it's going to sit behind me so that every single episode of my show from here on end uh, will have a little bit of product placement, which is completely wow. organic. Um, but I mean, um, I, I appreciate obviously the product placement, but what I mostly appreciate is that you uh, think positively about the book. I do want to say one thing. The book on its spine has two names and not one. And the other name is Nancy Green. And Nancy is one of the world's top designers. And what, and I've never said this about a book of mine, what I love about the book is the smell, the feel, the taste, the touch. Uh, you know, it is meant to be a condensation in every sense of the word. And she's a true artist. I said to her, your name ought to be first, not mine. Well, I, you know, <laughs> form and function, right? Substance and style. If we've learned anything uh, from that Jobs character, it is about form and function. It has yeah. to look good. It has to do good. It has to work good. Um, and one without the other is not good enough. And it's just as yeah. simple as that. There's some wonderful quotes about design and my ancient brain won't be able to pull them up exactly. But the one I think I love most came from the, I guess you'd say theologian Thomas Merton. And he was, he said, a shaker chair looks as if it was made someone by someone who believed an angel might come and sit in it. And I love that. I mean, that strikes me as a wonderful, wonderful definition of design. It, you know, I, I mean, it's in the book and, uh, you know, I, I was, um, I was not going to do you the, uh, the disservice by saying to people, this is an easy read. In fact, what I'm going to tell people is uh, it's a quick read, but it is a very difficult read. It's difficult because the truth hurts. It's difficult because it is the truth. It's difficult because it is so compelling. It is so commonsensical. Uh, and yet, of course, nobody does it. Not enough people do it. That's why I'm saying it's a quick read, but it is a difficult read because if it were easy, everyone would be doing it, which doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing it. And that's why I'm saying to you, the best service I can do to you is to tell people it's a quick, but it is a difficult read because it has 43 yeah, that, years you, of experience in it. No, you nailed it. That's exactly as it is intended. My hope is that people will not rush through from page one to whatever, but they'll pick a couple or stop on something and really examine it because I know it's self-serving in a way, but I think the, I mean, this, this is a Amazon at one point called it a quote book. And in a way it is, uh, I've used these words before, but I've always followed the quote with 700 explanatory words by Tom Peters, which may be brilliant, but they dilute things. This is the essence. This is the, this is the no baloney. And there's, I, as I said, I'm not trying to suck up. I think you nailed it. It can be read quickly. It is meant to be digested and thought about over a long period of time. And as we kind of suggest, the other, the other thing I want to say uh, that I'm not sensitive about, it is not a business book. It is indeed a book that focuses on organizations and people who work in organizations. But this applies as much to a local government or a nonprofit hospital as it does to some organization that's uh, making widgets, or that certainly is my belief. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna uh, suck up to you in, in return, 
um, <laughs> you know, when I say that I could literally for the rest of my life spend an episode of the show or even write an entire book on every chapter, sometimes even every quote, because I understand as someone who's written and someone who writes that ultimately the essence of a word, words matter, every word, every phrase, every sentence, every key quote. In fact, I provide a quote in every single one of my episodes. And you understand not only the words that are said, but who said those words. And when those words were said, how much weight that they carry. Yeah. Um, and, and they are portals to a whole new way of thinking. And so that to me, when I, I, I would never call it a book of quotes, I, I would, yeah. because it isn't. Thank you. I, I, I would obviously agree with you. Uh, but all my only point about that is it does attempt to boil things down to the essence. And it is the speaker. It is not Tom Peters 1000 words of interpretation, which may or may not be on the mark. You know, it's it, it's funny because as as you will see how how what's a dog-eared or or posted. In fact, I don't even know where it is. Here it is. I was I was busy going through it. I emptied the entire post-its. It's gone. It was I didn't even throw it away. And then I had to go to some other kind of stickies uh, in order to get to in order to get to the end of the book. Uh, I now have to go back and reread everything. Um, but it was just. And, and the other thing about it, Tom, that I loved is that it's not just Tom Peters quotes. It's a collection, which, I mean, on one hand, there's a humility about it. And I found like selfishly, I was just like, yeah, yeah, no, like, I don't need Branson. I don't need Arbus. I Where's the Tom Peters quotes? And then I kind of slowed down and of course realized that the body of work is really, and the influence that we spend in this world is not in isolation and solitary, but ultimately the connections and the inspirations of people that have given to us and that we have given back to in return. Well, it's funny. When I give a presentation, I always, or I'm almost always, 99% of the time, use PowerPoint slides. And the PowerPoint slides have no charts, no graphs. They have basically one of these quotes. And my line that I use with audiences, which is honest, is there's no reason for you to listen to me. I never ran a giant company. I never ran a government. But what I'm trying to say to you, look up there at that slide. You know, it was something that Thomas Merton said, or it was something that Richard Branson said, or what have you. Listen to them, not me. And, you know, there's no false humility in that, but it's it's saying, you know, it's not something that I've made up based on my education or whatever the hell else it was. This is stuff that real people, successful people, uh, people with incredible variety have said that seem to have stood the test of time. You know, there's an, another thing that you also uh, said earlier, which is this is not a business book. And, um, you know, when I read The Tipping Point uh, the, the first time, the genius the genius of that book was the fact that you didn't actually need to buy the book to understand what the book was about. Uh, my whole life, I've I've tried. I mean, even even with even with this book, Built to Suck, I try so hard just to come up with a name which people goes, which people look at and go, I don't need to. I don't need to read this book. I know what it's about. And so, the tipping point. It isn't a business book, and yet it is, of course. A business book but when you read it and you read about these amazing interesting stories you realize that 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 the kind of lines blur between what is considered business and what is considered life and then what you realize the business of life and the life of business it's all connected and interconnected just like this world we live in now where there is no work and there is no home there just is and and yeah. so that that's another thing it's like the great books the great business books are not business books and yet they are I think that's, I would, I would completely agree. All right. So now I was thinking, how do I, how do you prep for this book? And the only way to prep for the book for, for me was to actually say, I'm going to go through the book from, from start to finish or as much as I can with you. Um, so as not to just 
just chronologically and 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 i'll skip out on a few different things and i'll let you ultimately focus and dictate and and decide what you want to uh press on and what you want to kind of pull sure. back on and so uh so the book of course is called and look at i just realized how beautifully it mirrors as well like it's not backwards tom peter's compact guide to excellence we'll talk about extreme uh humanism because you know i was at the ana masters of marketing conference tom and there were a couple of things that like jumped out at me and hit me you know like a two by four through the face figuratively the first is i heard the word courage and bravery associated with marketing and marketers and business i've never heard that idea i've heard about risk taking and i've heard about mitigation never heard about courage and bravery those are inherently human qualities and then the other thing to that degree was they called it b4h or b2h business to human or or business for humanity another thing that i've never heard before i mean the pundits the gurus the ninjas talk about it but not at a c-suite level so before we start going through this i would love to hear your thoughts on courage and bravery in business and also um actually do you think this idea of of humanism is catching on and our business is catching up to this idea not just to be human but extremely human well i'm gonna i'm gonna obviously try to answer you but it's incredibly difficult to pick an epigraph for a book and and this is related to what you said the epigraph for this book comes from damon eat erotic the body shop founder and it says this i want to work for a company that contributes to and is a part of the community i want something not just to invest in i want something to believe in and i love those words and i think it's the best epigraph that i've ever used but your point is it, it is so well taken Or I, 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 you said it so well. I'm trying to find a way to work into it. The what I say to people is, unless you were born with the so-called silver spoon, you will spend more waking hours at work than you even will with your family collectively. And I know you love your family and that's the most wonderful thing in the world, but the reality, and, and, and you know, then I turned crude and I said, if you, if you piss away the working hours, you pissed away your life. But the point is it's, it's not, you know, there's the business part and there's the life. It, it is life. It is what we do. And all of it is done with our fellow human beings. And what we're talking about is the formation of communities, communities of our staff and ourself, communities with our vendors, communities with the communities in which we work and have facilities, communities obviously with our vendors and with our customers, but it's all communities. It's, it's, it's all about humanism. And one particular reason that I feel that's important in this book, that obviously it is being said, at least initially, in 2022 where all of the conversation is about ai this ai that ai takes over this and so on and i certainly i lived in silicon valley for 30 years i get it but at the end of the day it is our fellow human beings working at something trying to accomplish something of use one hopes to their peers to their communities and so on I mean, business is a human effort, period, all stop. Extreme humanism as a wild and crazy business idea is a stupid comment. That's what it is. I wrote on one of those pages, it is people serving people serving people, people called leaders serving people called our frontline team serving customers. But it's all about people. It's all about service period i read it 
I loved it. People serving people, serving people, uh, the connection between employees and customers, this idea that, that you're, you're, you will never treat your customer better than the way that you treat your employees. It's simple as that it's, you know, I, I loved so much in this book and, you know, I've just written my sixth book called forever changed how a global pandemic changed my direction my purpose and my life i love and, the title i have not seen the book well i'm about to ask you to actually write a little vignette in the book and now you have to say yes because of course <laughs> um but i actually said something in the book which which you just triggered right now there's a saying that says no one ever said on their deathbed they should have spent more, I should have spent more time in the office. And I immediately turned around and I, I twisted and I said, that is not true. Because now with us working at home, we should actually say I, I should have spent more time in the office when our office is our home and our home is our office. But ultimately what I was alluding to is love what you do, do what you love, love what you do, be true to yourself and stay the course. That is the formula to being forever changed. That is yeah. the formula to actually making the most of our time on this precious, our precious time on this small little planet and doing good in the process. And what I want to suggest, which you triggered with that, when you say love what you do, I think the premier role of the leader is to create a context in which you can grow, in which you can learn, in which you could, can develop that love for the skill or the product or whatever else it is. I agree with your words entirely. And, you know, I, I wrote also somewhere in there that leadership is the, that being a leader is the highest possible human achievement because, because the only true measurement of the leader is the success and growth of the people with whom she or he has led. Uh, I was giving a speech, oh, I don't know, five years ago in Mumbai, and sitting directly in front of me was an Indian Army general with four stars on his shoulder. And I think he was the commander of the Indian Army, which apparently is the largest in the world. And we got into a discussion of something or other, and he said, when I am making a promotion decision, there is only one thing that I primarily focus on, and that is what has happened in terms of growth to the people who worked for Tom Peters as a function of those two years that they spent with him. How did they grow? How did it influence the rest of their career? It says that my job as the person so-called in charge is to develop others. Uh, you know, there's another quote that I love from the director, the movie director, Robert Altman. And he said, the role of the, the role of the director is to create a space where actors and actresses can become more than they have ever been before, comma, more than they have ever dreamed of being. And I, that's the point. You know, obviously we're proud of our children or sometimes they have tough turns or what have you, but, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, the business is a family or is it a family. I'm just saying that the people we work with, that's our life. And, and one other thing that, you know, and part of it was triggered what you were saying about the, the remote work. When I talk about people who we are working with to whom to whose growth I am committed, I am talking about the seven week project temporary employee, as much as I'm talking about the person who plans to stay for 35 years. During that seven years, sorry, seven weeks, they should have had a growth experience. I remember years and years ago when John Scully was the chief executive officer of Apple. And he said, I can't, I can't promise you a career at Apple. I can't promise you 10 years at Apple. I can't promise you a year at Apple. But I will promise you 
that during the time you work with us, you will grow more than you could have grown in any other situation. And, and I have always thought that was a lovely way of stating it. This brings me back to a saying that I remember hearing when I worked at Nando's, my first, my first job, Nando's Chicken Land. And we used to say, Nando's allows ordinary people to realize extraordinary aspirations. I remember that clearly. It was taking someone who'd failed at business or an electrician or or someone who wanted to try and be an entrepreneur and, and, and give it a go as a joint venture partner. Nando's allowed and empowered people, ordinary people, to, to achieve and reach extraordinary heights. I think it comes down to another Tom Peters quote, which is a leader's job is to create more leaders, not to be the smartest person in the room, not to be the person at the top dictating, autocratting, mandating, and instilling fear and respect, commanding yeah. respect, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and one thing you've implied, which I think I also said somewhere or other, I've said it in my speeches, is we're not talking about Stanford computer science graduates or MIT computer science graduates who are working in the IT industry. This does hold for every organization. I've said my ideal job would be to be the head of a 53 person uh, housekeeping department in a big hotel. And I chose 53 and I'm really Americanizing the hell out of this at this point, because that's the number of players on an American National Football League team. And I said, listen, there is no difference between a 53 person professional team roster and a 53 person housekeeping department. We are a group of human beings attempting to be of service to our fellow human beings. And whether it happens in a hotel or whether it happens on a sports field in front of a jillion people on television, it is the same thing. It is that people serving people serving people. And it has not a damn thing to do with whether you've got 16 degrees from leading schools or whether because of economic or whatever reasons you dropped out after the fourth grade. I think there is a, a number and it could be 100, it could be 150. There is a proven research number after which things begin to derail from a scale standpoint where intimacy is checked at the door. And I, and I forget the exact number, but it could be uh, let's just say it's around 53. Let's rename it. Let's rebrand it as 53. But I think it's around 100 or 150. And, and it's at that point when suddenly you don't know the names of everyone you work with or work around. It's at that point when something dies or gets lost inside the corporation. And um, you talk about the size. I mean, it was music to my ears as someone who wrote Bill to Suck that, you know, suckage is inevitable, that size, scale, economies of scale, uh, you know, giganticism, uh, it all leads to a slowing down of a competitive edge. And it all leads to the opposite of humanism, which is now yeah. the automation, et cetera, et cetera. I would love for you to kind of riff on that for a bit. Um, because, well, I think, an, first of all, I think you're, I, we may have read the same thing. I don't remember either for sure, but it was some number like 100 or 150. And there are a handful of things that I would say in response to that. Uh, if there is a guru class that I am or am not a part of, God help us, my one of my, if not my largest criticism of that guru class is they slash we have focused almost exclusively on the Fortune 500, the FTSE 100, the giant corporations. And that's a horrible mistake on many dimensions, not least of which is that in, in the United States, something like 7% of us work for the Fortune 500, which means using simple math, 93% of us don't. 
And so much of what is written focuses on what are they doing at General Electric? What are they doing here? What are they doing there? The real economy is the so-called SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises. They do not create 100% create of the jobs. They create well over 100% of new jobs. The big guys are losing jobs after a certain period of time, and all the growth. And the research again says all the growth, all the innovation comes from these smaller companies. And yeah, we can be talking about a one person or two person enterprise, which is fine and dandy. But the ones that I really love to find are the ones who have 50 employees, 100 employees, 150 employees, and they've taken some little grubby piece of business and turned it into something exciting. One that I've written about in my last two books is uh, from Connecticut is called Basement Systems Inc. And what they do is take moldy, damp basements and turn them into, no, not palaces, but into playrooms, into extra bedrooms, into places that are clean and not damp and so on. They add an extra room to your house. And by transforming basements, among other things, they have grown in to a $100 million plus wow. company. And in fact, the guy who started it, Larry Janeski, wrote an entire book that was called Dry Basement Science. And so I'm so much more in love with Basement Systems, Inc. than with a Silicon Valley company or a company with 82,373 employees. I just love that stuff. Well, I, I'm in Connecticut, so I'm going to do a little bit of a house call and go and visit. Uh, go see Larry. Yep. I, I'm going to. I'm going to say Tom sent me. Um, yep. As long as they don't call security, I think I, I think it's going to work out is, fine. Is there a Seymour, Connecticut? Uh, you know, there's a C less. There's a Seymour. There is a. There is a. No, I, I had. No, some there sense, is. I, I I can't. There I, is. I'm. I'm, enough, I'm planning. I think that was the low. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There is a Seymour. Firm. And and I'm planning my road trip uh, as we speak. Fabulous. Um, now, I I love the juxtaposition when we look at growth, where the real growth is coming from. I mean, there is a, a an, an unbelievable uh, series of quotes or or data points uh, about about the lack of growth that there pretty much is zero growth in these. Uh, Goliaths in these behemoths. Uh, I won't spoil the reveal. Uh, you're going to need to go and, and buy this book and read this book uh, to see it. Um, but you know, there's, um, I mean, we may as well just get into it now. I was going to save it for the end, but uh, there is a, a, a rather interesting uh, visionary by the name of Elon, uh, who shares some accent with mine as well. And that's probably where uh, the commonality stops now. I hope. Uh, <laughs> I trust you. Your trust is your trust is is uh, is will will not be uh, will not be dis, uh, disappointed. I promise. So here he is. He's gone and laid off a whole bunch of people. And what's so interesting with this Twitter move is that whether you call this opportunism or extreme humanism, there are companies coming out and saying. If you've lost your job at Twitter, we will hire you. Come to us. We will hire you. And of course, there's a little bit of PR and there's a little bit of, you know, opportunism. But I love that because that's basically saying you lost your home. Come and come and stay in ours or come into yeah, ours. I love that too. New Zealand, 6427528. Sorry. No, that's great. No, I'm... It's New Zealand. Actually, this is it. my hello. Hello. Hello, Tom. Happy birthday. Hey, hey, no, 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 no. I, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of a podcast. Can you call in a half an hour? I got you. Fine. Right. My wife is in New Zealand, and I am therefore paying attention to calls that come from New Hold Zealand. On, did, did I hear happy birthday? Yeah. Today? Is, is your yeah, birthday today is, today is my birthday well you know what uh because this is that this is the daily show for business 
And because you are, I don't even know what guest you are because you've been on before, but there've been about 412. Uh, so I am going to, I'm going to hold up the book and I'm going to sing, uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Tom Peters, the management guru. Happy birthday to you. Are you one? Are you two? Skip a few. Uh, 21 years old. Uh, how many, how many uh, podcast hosts have sung happy birthday to you? Uh, this is absolutely an exclusive, a first, a memorable, uh, all of those things. My I life, my life is complete. Go down in the, in the book of memories. My life is complete. I want to talk to you about two leaders in the, I am, by the way, I'm smiling from ear to ear because my entire plan of going through every single one of these notes, we're not even going to get to open the book. And I love that. I love that because I know what's in this book <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, uh, of all the books that you will ever need to purchase in your life, this needs to be number one. You need to sleep with it underneath your pillow. Uh, it's like the princess and the pea, the uh, the business leader and the book. Uh, you need to you need to fold it if you can and put it into your jacket pocket. Um, this book for me, especially when you said it in the inscription, forty three years, forty three years condensed in. It almost doesn't seem fair to use uh, money, uh, it is priceless, it is, it is invaluable. Well, That's my plug you are, for you. You are kind beyond words. Uh, it really was an effort to pull a lot together. And as you have pointed out, it was a, a dramatic effort to let other people do the talking. So I like, want you- Like Ms. Roddick, with whom we started. And, and now I want you to comment on two different leaders. I want us to go back to, we'll, we'll, we'll go with uh, two on opposite sides of the extreme. First of all, Elon Musk. How, what is, what is Tom Peters' perspective on Elon Musk? Separating um, Tesla, SpaceX, and now this- this. Kitty, I'm on a podcast. Sorry. We've got a lot going on on my birthday. This is life. Re-ask the Musk question. All right. You know, I'm not editing any of this stuff. This is how I That's think fine. it should. This is how I think, you know, as long as. Great. This is the real world. I, I love mean, that. it is. So I love that. I'm telling you, it's the only way. So I want to. Okay. I hear then I heard your question. It was about Elon. <laughs> uh, yes. Tom Peters on Elon Musk. How should we react to him? How should we do we buy? Do we not buy? What's going on? Sometimes I'll just say with a bit of context, as I've often said, when we look at the visionaries and we can contrast him with Richard Branson, they're different or Steve Jobs. They're not of, of this world. They're not like us. We can try and understand them, but will we truly ever understand them? But I just want to hear what Tom Peters has to say about Elon Musk. Well, no, no smart aleck remarks. I do not pretend to understand him. I do not pretend to understand the profit and loss statement for Twitter. I think that there are times in organizations where difficult decisions have to be made, but I don't think there is any decision in any organization. But let me, let me tell you a story which will answer it in a different way, okay? I give a bunch of speeches and I have a speakers bureau called the Washington Speakers Bureau. And I've known him for all those 40 years and known the guy who started it and so on and so forth. Um, at the beginning of the, wasn't the pandemic, it was the crash of 2010 or some damn thing like that. I went down to visit and they'd had, you know, when the crash came along, the big events went down the drain and the need for speakers went down the drain and they got really clobbered. Uh, so I went down and was chatting and the woman who is president, I think maybe CEO, his name is Christine Farrell. Somebody said, 
you would not believe it. I walked into Christine's office and saw Christine in tears and someone that she had just laid off giving her a hug and saying, it's okay, Christine. I know how difficult things are. I know you had to do this. It's okay. But the notion of a boss laying someone off and having the employee and crying about it and having the employee hug them, well, I think you don't have to say that wasn't Elon. So whatever the situation is, no matter how dire, I think there is, it's this extreme humanism thing again, I think there is a humane way to deal with it. Incidentally, if we don't like Mr. Musk, which I don't, and my memory isn't good enough here, but there is a relatively new book that came out on everybody's CEO God list, Jack Welsh, that basically said, did Jack Welsh destroy capitalism? And his layoffs were at least as crude as Mr. Musk's, though maybe not made with the same panache that in the age of social media makes it into the front pages. Uh, you know, he, he was, there, it's a horrible term. One of his nicknames was Neutron Jack. He's like a neutron bomb. When Welsh leaves, the building is still standing, but all the people are gone. And, you know, that, that, that's pretty that's crude language. It's a perfect segue to really just one more. We, we're going to go from, from now the one side of the extreme to the other. And, um, you know, I have become not just enamored, but really all in on, and I think in, in many respects, people like Philip Kotler and yourself, um, John Mackey, so many people are now starting to inspire me and, and realizing this is catching on. I call it community capitalism. I call it the evolution of capitalism. And it is something that I believe that we are seeing now in this web three space, shared ownership and shared rewards, or at least a glimpse of what is to come. And then amidst all of this development, we see the founder of Patagonia essentially give the entire company away. Now that is the opposite extreme. Will most companies ever do that? No, not even close. But now at least the stake has been put into the ground, the line I in agree. the sand. I agree. And on a, on a not so grand scale, going back whatever it was now, 25 years ago, there was something called ESOPs. And the ESOPs were employee share ownership programs and not quite the extent, obviously, of Patagonia, but the goal was to make the, when share prices went up and business was good, to make sure that in a direct one-for-one -one way that employees benefited. Let me tell you about my least favorite statistic, which is completely consistent with what we've been talking about for the last five minutes. The Nobel laureate, the late Nobel laureate, in economics, Milton Friedman, in September of 1970, wrote an article, single article in the New York Times, in which he said, businesses have no social responsibility. Hard as it may be believed, and it's not with Friedman, that's a different story. That's what he said. At the time that he said that, in 1970, 50% of profits went to shareholders, senior team members, et cetera, and 50% of profits went to people, research and development, et cetera. My old friends and, and now discredited, sad to say, friends at McKinsey did a study in 2014, which means 44 years later. Remember, 50% for the owners, 50% for the people. In 2014, 91% of profits went to shareholders, share buybacks, and executives. And that number, nine, 9% went to employees, research, and so on. And that number disgusts me 
more than I think any number I have ever come across in my entire adult life, which is now roughly a million years. I mean, that's awful. I mean, I don't care whether you think 50-50 is right or good or bad. 50-50 to 91-9, for God's sake. Well, I mean, it's... it's, we want, it's... And wait a minute, let's go another paragraph with that. Sure. And saying that, what has it created? It has created incredible inequity. It is indirectly, or maybe directly, in my opinion, responsible for a lot of the social turmoil that's going on now. Uh, it's not just a random number. It's a big, big number with big, 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 big implications. I was just going to add that we see those uh, imbalances and inequities even with respect to the acquisition versus the retention funnel, the idea of courting what I call the stranger and the prostitute, the first time buying the promiscuous customer versus the lover, the fan, you know, the loyalist, et cetera. But, but I, I, want to, I want to just go back to um, a new term uh, that I have created, and I'm going to say inspired by Tom Peters. It's not the ESOP, it's the CSOP. And it's actually doing the same thing with customers. And in fact, I can tell you that with this book, Forever Changed, customers will earn royalties. It may be the first book in the world where customers are earning royalties as well, where royalties are now being shared with the people that buy the book. And I believe, I it. That, I believe it could become the new model. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And, and one more thing we saw as well, and then, and then what I'm going to do is, is looking at the time is uh, I'm going to, I've got a few members of the community. Uh, we actually convene every morning from eight to nine, Monday through Friday, and we do a virtual coffee manifestation and we have time and we just support one another and spread love and hope and positivity and optimism in the business world. And it's, Tom, what I believe every company is going to be doing. That's my prediction. And I'm going to play a role, making sure that every day, 30 minutes, 60 minutes before business starts, that there is a virtual coffee, meditation, manifestation, motivation, yeah. mental health. So you're invited to come and, and, and drop by any day you want. And so Thank I'm going to, you. I'm going to bring some of them uh, into the conversation, see if they have questions for you. Now they're thinking of those questions. Fabulous. Now, I was just going to say, one thing we saw Starbucks do a while ago is treating their part-time employees, employees, uh, and I'm going to get back to that in a second, their barristers, et cetera, giving them full medical, dental, healthcare coverage, you know, giving them share options. That's exactly what you said earlier, which is yeah. anybody that gives their time, their effort, their energy, even one minute away from their family, why on earth wouldn't you treat them like family? Yeah, there was, oh gosh, again, the name escapes me. There was a major grocery chain, name forgotten, headquartered in Florida, and it did exactly what you just said. The part-timers all had the same, among other things, health coverage that the full-timers did. And may I be damned forever for not remembering the name. Well, I, I was just going to say the final point, and then I'll bring a few people into this, uh, is that um, we know that Disney calls their customers guests and uh, calls their employees cast members. I just heard a presentation from American Express where they've done away with the word employee, and they now call people who work there colleagues it's actually something that i wrote in built to suck and i said ban the employee for god's sake yeah. let's stop calling our talent employees well my my version of that is never again utter the term human resources i am not a human resource i am tom peters son of evelyn s peters and frank j e peters i am not a resource i am not a human resource i am tom Absolutely love that. I don't know if this is going to work, Tom, uh, but this is the, that's the air horn, which is not an opportunity to end the interview. But if you did hear that, uh, it's, um, this has been just an absolute pleasure. I'm going to uh, let people know, uh, if you want to, uh, you can unmute yourselves. 
if you would like to uh, come onto stage, um, just uh, uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do, which is come off camera. And that way I'm, I'm going to know that you want to ask Tom a question. You need to ask Tom a question. You want to ask Tom a question. This is a golden opportunity. So Sharon, Lubna, Bez, uh, come off camera and, and, and uh, come onto the show. Cat got your tongue. It happens, Tom. You're a very intimidating person. Oh, well, they can't because they've been disabled. It's so funny. The joke's on me. All right, go for it. Now you can come off. All right. Well, I'm not trying to be narcissist, and uh, but I was trying to put a picture of myself, and I I don't know how it got in the background. But <laughs> I do have a question for you. Um, Just don't move, Ms. Bez, and then you don't look like a narcissist. That's and, cool. Hey, I can deal with that. I'm sorry. I still haven't showered or shaved, but uh, that's why that looks better. But um, my my question is um, has changed because of what you mentioned about the 91 percent. Um, so I um, practice in the people function in corporate America, not human resource, even though they call it that. And it said uh, I have noticed a pro proliferation of just bad leaders. And I can tell you for certainty that's the case because you, when you have a high count of employee relations cases and you peel back the onions, you just got bad supervisors. So why is that? I mean, I have my thoughts, but you know, you're the the guru and or the expert in this area and in, in uh, leadership and management. Why do we have such a proliferation of bad leaders? And is it getting worse? Well, I'm gonna work around a little bit. Uh, near the top of the list is we do a crappy job of picking leaders. A really crappy job of picking leaders. It's that old one liner is don't promote the best salesman to sales manager. Uh, there's more to life than EQ, but no one should ever be allowed to lead who does not have a very high EQ. Uh, there was the, I have argued and will argue, regardless of the size of the company, whether it's a, a 25 person company with three so-called manager leaders or a 2,500 person company, the, the collection of first line leaders is the number one company asset. The first line leaders are responsible for quality, for productivity, for satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so no group of human beings is more important. That's number one. Number two, which is a little bit larger than your question, is I quoted a guy who runs a successful biotech company. And he said, our secret is we only hire nice people. He said, now I'm in biotech. He said, there are degrees that people have where you wouldn't even understand the name of the degree. But he said, I figured this thing out. And that is regardless of how obscure that degree is, there are a lot of people who have it in the world. Pick the nice ones. And the way he does it is you're some hot shot with one of these very sexy degrees and top grade point average forever and ever. And I fall, in, I'm the CEO and I fall in love with you. I'll die to have you on the payroll. Well, it doesn't matter. When you and I have finished our interview, you then go on and have a half a dozen 15 minute interviews with other employees, a lower level person in the finance department, a mid-level person in R&D, whatever, whatever, whatever. And each of those half dozen people who has the interview with you has the right and responsibility to say, no, I don't want him on our team. And so I think that sort of thing just makes an enormous difference. And I'll give you a, another like example. On almost all the darn lists of top 
healthcare organizations, the Mayo Clinic comes in number one or number two or whatever, always at the top. So we're going to play the same game. You are a famous neurosurgeon from the XYZ hospital in ABC. And I'm interviewing you for a job. You don't know, and we'll go back, I think you can still do it today. What you don't know is that while I'm interviewing you, I'm scratching something on my hand. And what I'm scratching, and, and listen carefully, is the number of times you use the word I, and the number of times you use the word we. And if the eyes beat the we's, I don't care what the hell your record is, you ain't working here. And the interesting thing about that, if it sounds at all quirky, is that goes back to 1914 and Dr. Mayo, who started the Mayo Clinic, who said that healthcare, I doubt that he used the word team maybe in those days, he said, healthcare is a team practice. And when you look in the average hospital where the doctors don't respect the nurses, et cetera, et cetera, it ain't that way. So I, I don't know, what, well, there are a million stresses that may make the average person not quite as cheerful as they were in the past, but I do know there is a fix. And that is hire the right people. And Peter Drucker long ago said, every promotion decision is a life or death decision. Mm. And, and that's, I think and Mr. That's Drucker, the with whom I didn't always agree, got that one right. That's and in the book as well. There's another guy who wrote a book, and I don't remember the name of the guy, and I don't remember the name of the book, which is not very helpful. Uh, but it was an entire book about hiring. And what he said, in effect, was hiring is the most important act in any company, and it is not well understood and not paid attention to enough. And I have no problem with that that uh, that concoction. I, I, I love it. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got time for, uh, we've got Lubna who's gonna ask a question in audio and then maybe Sharon will do audio or video. Uh, Bez, you've, you've got to be in your element right now because this is, <laughs> this is just, I could just see the smile on his face. It's ridiculous. Uh, uh, I, I love it and thank you. Um, I, uh, your book, I, uh, search of excellence in the early nineties because, uh, workforce, but it's still, I find things that are very relevant. So thank you for your thought leadership. Well, thank you for your kind question. And yeah. thanks for buying my book back in the nineties. It's weird because Tom was only born in the 2000s. So that's weird. That's um, you got uh, it. You Lubna, it. Lubna uh, we'll go over to you. I think you're just going to ask the question in audio. Yes, I am. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be with you and to have listened into the interview. And I would love to circle back to something that uh, was shared at um, about 30 minutes ago, I believe. Um, I believe he said the tr true measurement of success of a leader is the success of the people. And um, real leaders are committed to the growth. How do you know someone is genuinely committed to your growth? I, I can really give you a weird answer. Uh, and it's something I like to talk about a lot, so it gives me an excuse to say it. Uh, and we'll go back to something like elementary school, junior high school, or what have you. Kids come into a classroom. The teacher stands in the doorway and he greets each of the kids. And he says, good morning, David. Good morning, Judith. How you doing? Judith, how's that head cold you had? Whatever. It's not five minute conversations. It's one question or no questions or just good morning it's just a recognition the teacher does that and this is measurable and the number of disciplinary issues drops by 25 percent and measures of academic engagement go up by 20 percent just because of that greeting 
Now, why am I using that as an answer to your question? Because I think the whole, I think if you and I had a conversation, just two people, we don't even barely know each other except for a minute and a half. And we would talk about the world. I would ask you what you're up to. I would ask you what you think the new current job is all about. I'd ask you if there's stuff you'd like to learn. How can I help you? And we would just, you know, we just have a boringly normal conversation, but a conversation that made it clear that I really was interested in where you were, where you wanted to go, and how maybe I could help. But it's like that teacher standing in the doorway. There's nothing sexy, sophisticated, or anything like that. It's just acknowledging you as a human being. And frankly, which kind of goes back to the last question, many, most bosses do not do that. I mean, it's, it's well, you know the answer to the question you asked better than I do. When is a human being engaged with his or her fellow human being? And when is a human being not engaged with his or her fellow human being? And leadership is about engagement. And if that act of standing in the doorway and saying good morning and asking you whether your cold's getting any better, that's leadership more than any damn when thing you know, the Harvard you know. Business School ever even dreamed of teaching. When you know, you know. All right, we, we have time. Uh, Lubna, I hope, uh, I, hope uh, uh, I, I know he answered your question, but uh, I'm going to bring thank you. on. Wait, wait, before, thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a wonderful question. Well, thank you for answering it. I appreciate that. And and I'm only rushing only because I know that Tom has his next uh, his next engagement pressing. But uh, I, th I think uh, the uh, clearly an angel is in front of us. Uh, Sharon, uh, uh, there's time to ask a quick question and hopefully Tom will give a quick answer. Uh, this has just been um, a very, very special day uh, in my life um and uh and especially on your on your 21st birthday but sharon go ahead and ask your question yeah i apologize i don't know what's wrong with my video right now <laughs> um mr peters i wanted to ask you given your uh you know breadth of experience what's the one piece of advice you wish you had taken oh my gosh how can we end this inner this whole darn interview with a question that difficult <laughs> <laughs> oh boy i don't want i don't i don't want to give a smart aleck off the top of my head answer the one piece of advice i wish i had listened to well i think oddly enough it's related to the last question. So my parents didn't have any money. The Navy paid my way through university. Uh, I served four years. I was a civil engineer, and my first two years were as a Navy combat engineer in Vietnam. Uh, and what that meant, there were obviously people in the middle of the ranks, but what that meant was technically and emotionally, I was responsible for other people's lives. I was not some army special forces person who went out into the jungle every night. Don't get me wrong. I was a construction guy, but people were killed, people were wounded and so on. And so I've got 15 young men working for me. And I didn't take them seriously. I remember we had, I think it was quarterly evaluations. I sat down after my fourth beer in the officer's club and filled out those quarterly evaluations in probably seven and a half minutes and my eyes were blaring. And it was, shit, got that job out of the way. Uh, and, and so I just wish that I had learned earlier the importance of what it means to be in a position where you have responsibility for others and i didn't ask what i didn't ask i mean i was trained as an engineer engineers don't even know there are human beings in the world 
and suddenly I'm in responsible for the lives of people. I didn't, I didn't ask anybody, how the hell am I supposed to do this? I was an engineer. I knew that I knew better than everybody about everything. That's the definition of an engineering education. And oh, shit, did I ever blow it relative to that first situation. Excuse the crude language, but it's the only language I can think of to answer your question. We we got a Tom Peter snarl there right at the end. Sharon, I'm going to I'm going to tuck you away, uh, but I'm going to give you an opportunity just to say uh, goodbye to Tom. And I want to just. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask a follow up, but um, that's OK. Nah, come on. Give me a quick follow up. Oh, Make the, it quick. The follow up was which which what what piece of advice do you wish you had given? That I had given? Yeah. Oh, boy. Let's go back to ending it after the last question. Uh, the, the next piece of advice. How about that? That That's the Drucker the line, right? What was advice. his best book? The next one. Uh, the advice that I wish I had given. Only way I really know how to answer is pretty much the same answer as before. No, I, uh, damn, that's a hard question. The best piece of advice that I wish I had given. I don't want to be responsible well, for the Tom Peter Stumper here, but. No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> a lot of these things, I'm talking about, oddly enough, were initiated at the age of 37 or 38 or 39 when we were doing the first research for In Search of Excellence. And that's when I learned that the best companies took the best care of their people. And I had my own company and I had been in the Navy and for seven years at McKinsey and Company. And I wish. I just wish that I had taken the people stuff seriously enough. That's not really an answer to your question, but it's the only thing when I think of your question, maybe I'm focusing more on the last answer. I just wish, wish, wish that the things that I care about now and feel that are life and death for leadership had come to me a hell of a long time before my 40th, uh, my 40th year. And that also includes personal relationships, I might add. Look, it's 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 the perfect answer, Sharon. Do not do not come up with a with a with a third stumper. Um <laughs> thank you, Sharon. Um I, I can answer both of those questions. First of all, the advice that you wish you'd given, you don't need to wish anymore because it is in this book. The best time to plant an oak tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. When you buy this book, do not plant it, uh, read it, uh, 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 dog ear it, do et cetera. And probably the best advice that you should have taken was not to, was when they told you not to come on the show. Uh, but unfortunately, you did not listen. I've had, I've, had, I've had a wonderful time with your questions, your comments, and then this last 10 minutes with some of your colleagues. Uh, that's what makes life worth living. It, it was so special. Thank you. For thank, this opportunity no thank you and obviously I, thank you for the kind words about the book it's all it's all from the heart if there is a topic and and a and a title for this episode initially it was going to be damn you tom peters uh for uh for because i couldn't find one thing to say and so i didn't say anything we just we just had a real conversation from the heart but but now i know what the title of this will be it will be i love you tom peters I love you for what you've done, what you've brought to this world, how you've inspired, how you've changed lives, uh, and and the personal inscription, I love you, Tom Peters, on your birthday. Well, I cannot think of a more wonderful birthday present. So in general, and in particular because of the day of the interview, thank you. You're welcome. You are Chuck Norris approved. <laughs>